Hi everyone, my name is Katarina. I want to talk about some a bit more different uh, software development process today, which I like to call time-driven development. Uh, a little bit of background before we start. So I'm a software engineer and since recently part of the Mozilla Tech Speakers community, which is an amazing network and they support sharing knowledge about all things open source. You should check it out, it's, it's really good. Uh, and additionally, I am the co-founder of Adiva, where I'm able to collaborate a lot with uh, companies who need help scaling their engineering teams. So we're an exclusive network, and working in an environment like that, I've had a chance myself to consult with a lot of different companies, from startups to enterprises. And combining those two uh, backgrounds, I managed to understand the value of time as an asset in software development teams. So that's why I decided to talk about this topic and try to find this balance between what's the value for the business and what's the value for the team, basically. Before that, so when I was starting, I didn't really have a chance to understand it that, is that good. So in the beginnings, I was working with a startup as a single engineer. And I, was, I had the opportunity to experiment a lot and uh, to try to develop all this good architecture, try to comply with all the best practices. And it was really well. The client was uh, also a perfectionist, so we had really a lot of time to develop the product. And a year later, after we've designed all the software that would be extendable because we expected that we would need to extend and scale, the startup failed. So at that point, I was like, I spent all this time trying to develop all this great architecture, develop something that would be able to scale really easily when we have more users. But at the end, it didn't happen. We, we never had any users, and we never had to scale that much. So it got me thinking that all this time could be spent much better if we just decided to release faster, release initial versions, and then spend this time testing with our users and try to understand what features they actually needed. So I want to ask you first, before we go any further, have, have you ever had a similar experience where you built something and then you just realized you spent a lot of time on it, yeah, realized you're not going to use it anymore? So it's, this is why I want to talk about this topic, just because we need to think of time as something that we invest in the product and we need to think how we're going to allocate that. And we're not the only ones, so there are a lot of evidences on the internet of people being sick of trying to comply with all these best practices that they just they treat it as the end goal. They do all, the, all it takes to achieve clean code or to comply with solid. They don't think about what are the trade-offs of it. So this is Johannes. It was a f pretty popular tweet last year. He wrote a blog about it, saying that we need to embrace compassionate code where we will think more about why we are doing things instead of how we are doing them. And another example of it is, this is a Stack Overflow question. This user actually talked about how their team was trying so hard to comply with solid design principles uh, that they ended up fragmenting their, their code so much it was unmaintainable. So for the sake of single responsibility principle, they had too many classes, too many de dependencies, they, that they ask how can we refactor away from it. So this is a uh, red flag that we're doing something wrong if we're using the best practices this way. And this pops a question, why are we trying so hard to be proud of our code and proud of how we design it? So this is actually part of the obligation of the programmer by Uncle Bob. And this is something that people who we admire impose to the community and then we try to follow it just because we think it's right. He says that the bottom line, is, bottom line of everything that we do is that we're proud when we go home and think about what we accomplished that day. And that's great. We should feel proud because we built something. People use it, people find it valuable and improves their lives. But it's not that we should be proud that we used all these tools like TDD or Solid to build it. We should be proud that we actually built something that brings value. So that's when I started thinking about time-driven development as a concept that could change this and create a bit more balance. 
seems like we've created this toxic environment where we care too much about how we do things and what tools we use, and not at all about what value they would bring, if any, to the users or to our fellow developers, for that matter. In reality, things can work a little bit differently as well. So this is a very exaggerated example. I'm not going to try to convince you that it's a good idea to throw everything in one file and just release it. But still, it works for some people, and it brings value to the business. So that's maybe the thing that, that matters. So we should think of it as having different solutions for different problems and not having one size that fits all. So time-driven development is the process that I have imagined to come as a balance between two sides, like decide when we need to just ship something fast, test it, and then improve it and refactor it over time. And on the other side, when we should actually care about the architecture and how we implement things to make sure they would scale if we need them to scale. To explain this better, uh, I want to use two examples from my personal experience. So as I said, we're a network of engineers, and first we started as a local agency. Over time, as we grew, we decided we had to do something like a platform or a solution that would help us to organize everything and be able to keep track of all the developers in our network and all of the jobs that we had. And so, at first, we didn't want to invest a lot into this and spend that whole year again developing things. We wanted to go in and try things, test them, and improve them as we, as we went. So we decided to use uh, a CRM for storing the data at first. This is that profile page. It's how it looks like. And this is just uh, the front-end interface. In the background, we connect with an API using a CRM system that looks like this. So this is a single class, uh, Zoho, that's the name of the CRM. So it's a single class that basically uh, has all of the API uh, calls that we need to make for accessing that data and updating that data, getting data for the candidates, um, getting their experiences, educations, updating everything on the go. And in the controller, we were depending on this single class. So it was. This part where we are instantiating this class and then using the specific methods that that offers. So we would know, the controller here knows a lot. It knows what methods we should use and how we should behave to update these details, actually uh, in this part to just get them and pass them to the view. But it still knows a lot about the implementation in the background. And this part over here is very dependent on the CRM itself and its naming conventions. So when we had to change afterwards, we would need to go ahead and change all these variables with the new names. So basically, the idea was to use this at the beginning. And then as we go forward, as we started to learn to just switch to the new local database, MySQL, and then re-implement this using that local storage. And this is on the view side. So again, we are accessing, we are using these naming conventions that are very specific for the CRM, so it would be hard to change them if we had to. And also, we are using arrays to access that data because it's how we get it from the API. So we don't care that in the future, we would probably need to replace this with collections. So what would it take to switch the storage? As I said, we wanted to have this as a temporary solution, and then as we went forward to update it, to change it basically with uh, MySQL storage. But it wasn't just this profile example. So if it, it was only this, we would be able to quickly change the two controller methods and be done with it. We had a lot of dependencies in the background. We had uh, jobs and contracts and everything related to all of the clients and all of the developers we, needed, we had to match that we basically had a lot to handle when we when we decided to change this, the storage. I will show you a quick example of how this looked like. So this is, it's just a diff of both, uh, of two branches, basically. The first one is um, the initial version where we use the CRM, and then what changes we had to make to change that. And you can see over here, this is the controller, and it ha only has two methods, the edit and update. But you will notice that all of you don't need to read this code, maybe it's too small you will just notice that there are a lot of changes. So everything is removed and then replaced with something else. And this means that we should probably have to do this in all other places on the admin side for all other features like jobs and uh, 
projects and whatever we have related to the candidates, and that was a lot of overhead for us. So let's see what it takes to switch the storage. First, we should add the eloquent models, which is fine. We would definitely have to do that if we want to uh, use the, the MySQL storage. Then change all of the controller dependencies to depend on that model. And use that to pull the data from the view instead of, uh, instead of the, the CRM API. What this means is we need to change all of the dependencies, but also change the implementation and the logic behind it to use now these new methods and new naming uh, to implement that. Switch all of the variables the way we access them and uh, their naming convention. Change the way we access the data in the views. And finally, adjust the unit tests and everything else in the background to work ac accordingly with the new changes. So this was a lot. And again, it might, might not seem a lot for this particular example, which is overly simplified, but it's a lot of change to handle on the whole system. It, not only would it take a lot of time, it would make it much more valuable afterwards and much more error prone if we changed everything. So we want to keep the course stable, but still be able to change all this as we grow. And that's how we started to think about how can we save time if we improve the code design. So this is the right example where you should apply principles like solid, which I will explain a bit uh, shortly, uh, and not by like on any code and uh, in any problem. The first thing is don't depend on concrete implementations. Most of you probably heard the talk uh, this morning. You're, uh, I hope, all familiar with this. Uh, the thing is, we should replace the concrete implementations and concrete dependencies in our controllers and then change them with uh, abstractions. So this is the interface we, we are building for that. Uh, we have this candidate repository interface, uh, which defines all of the methods that we will need to implement to be able to uh, develop this functionality. And uh, it has the methods that we are using from the CRM API now, and the methods that we would need to implement when we use the MySQL storage. And now in the edit method, we go and depend on this interface instead of depending on the actual implementations, which was the CRM API. Now you will see that over here we have the get candidate by ID, a, methods that, a method that we know exists because we are using that interface to depend on it. And this would work really well because whenever we need to replace this with something new, we would just need to create a new repository to implement this interface, and then it would be all working out of the box. It's the re using the repository pattern, basically. The second part is to be mindful about what our program expects. And this is something that touches something about the list of substitution principle of solid. And it means that we should know what uh, our program expects. And whenever we change it, we should know that what that change would cause. Ideally, we need to strive to have code where changing those things would not cause the program to break. And with our example with the views, if we just change the source, the program would basically break because it would, need, it would be using arrays instead of collections to access the data. So this is the first step that I took here. It's a candidate class which kind of mocks the eloquent uh, models. And it has these uh, three methods over here which I try to use to, um, instead of the, uh, the relations. So the, that logic is um, removed for, for simplification, but it basically accesses these methods as properties as an eloquent would. And now in the view, we have this where we have uh, the titles and all of the variables that we, are, we need to access the data using a naming convention, convention that is more appropriate for all kinds of storages, not only the CRM that we're using now. And over here, we are using the relation. This is just a matter of preference. You don't need to do that, but still, uh, if we replace it with, uh, afterwards with Eloquent, this would just work out of the box. And finally, to make this work, we just need to bind these abstractions with uh, the concrete implementation. That's only this one line in uh, the service provider telling the, our program what it needs to instantiate if, if it gets this interface. So what happens here? 
To switch this storage, we had to add these eloquent classes, just like we need to, needed to before. But other than that, we didn't have to change anything. It was all a matter of adding new classes to implement this, and then just binding that new class with uh, the interface in our provider. And that saves a lot of time in making all these changes, but also it saves a lot of time in trying to solve, solve all the bugs that would come up if we had to change every single line of our code. And this is something that is the proper usage of all these principles, because it, would, it saves a lot of time going forward, not only uh, at the moment of development. Now, let's see another example using the same practices with um, a GitHub integration. We basically wanted to integrate GitHub to pull uh, data autom automatically for all the candidates and be able to use that for screening purposes. This is what we did. We decided to use the factory pattern because uh, we wanted to be able to extend it with Bitbucket or GitLab or whatever in the future. So we, we wanted this flexibility and extendability of the code. And we created this factory, which initializes the, the proper class depending on the type of account that the user has. And after that, we need this abstract version control because our classes need to implement this interface to know what methods we are expecting and to be able to use them. And this is how the concrete class looks like. So it implements this interface, and then it, has, uh, it makes a connection to the external uh, wrapper that we are using for accessing these API methods, but also it has an adapter class, which we have now to be able to adapt all of the um, data that we get from this API and then make it usable by, uh, by our program. So it's a lot of work to just adapt something to be able to use GitHub as, as, a, as a source. So what we did here is this. First, we are initializing the proper version control depending on uh, the user type or the account type that the user has. And then uh, we are getting all the details that uh, we needed from that user from their GitHub or other Git account. But the thing over here is that a year after, we worked on this, we wanted, to be, wanted it to be very extendable, we wanted to be able to implement a lot of new features as, as we went forward, but after a year, none of that code changed. So we're not using anything of what we developed, and we're, we never had to implement Bitbucket or GitLab or anything else for that matter. And so this was a lot of wasted time at the beginning, because we never knew whether or not we would have to uh, use this extendability of the code. So what's a better way to do it? It's actually just two lines of code. So using that same API, uh, same packages that we used in the previous example, if we weren't just adding this uh, factory methods and all this ex um, advanced architecture, we would just be able to implement this in 10 minutes using uh, the API and pulling the data for, for the user, basically. So, why time-driven development? The first thing is that software design practices come with trade-offs. And because they have their trade-offs, we need to know how to use them and how they, they could help us build software that's better, that's, uh, that brings more value to our users, but also that's more, um, that brings much better developer experience for our colleagues. In the first example, we saw that we had uh, this architecture that really helped us uh, de develop software that would be extendable, that would be uh, very easy to maintain and uh, change on the long run. So for that, we had to invest much more time at the beginning to build this proper architecture so that we could spend much less time in the future trying to change it. And that's the trade-off of those solid design principles, because you need to invest much more time up front so that you could spend much less time going forward. But what happened in the second example? 
So we tried to do the same approach. We tried to create all this nice architecture that would make it easy for us to extend the code and to change it. And it was all good, except we didn't need it. So that's a place where you should, where you should think more of the Yagnin principle, that you're not going to need that instead of trying to comply with solid or test-driven or whatever else the internet tells you you have to do. And those are the trade-offs of the software. You need to know them before you decide what's the best solution for the problem and then try to develop it. The second thing is that software design principles should simplify your life, not complicate it. Because if you find yourself in an environment where you try too hard to comply with solid, like that example for Stack Overflow, you will create a code where you won't be able to manage it, your colleagues won't be able to manage it, and it would be hard for you to even maintain and extend that because it's overcomplicated. You fragment it a lot, you depend on too much, and that makes it harder for you to work with it, not easier. And this is something that software design principles should teach us. We should use them to make our lives easier, not harder. And the third thing is that thinking about the bigger picture will let you bring much more to your code, to your customers, to your users. You, should, you would be able to bring much, much more value and not only think about what tools you use and how you build your code. Because that's time that you could invest trying to understand their problems, trying to get their feedback, and trying to improve your software and then use the best principles to do that. So how can you start practicing time-driven development? The first thing is to talk to your product uh, team or your leads, try to understand what are the business value, what the user wants, and how you can use that to implement a proper architecture for your software. And then use that knowledge to understand the big picture and create that, that software that would, uh, be, that would comply to it. You should always keep the context in mind where, when deciding on the solution to your problem. So the index PHP example and our example where we had to change the, uh, the storage of, of the software were two different scenarios that need two different solutions to the problem. And we shouldn't try to, to uh, force using solid or using anything else on any of them. Both of those have different ways of solving it, and they should both find the proper way to solve their problem. And finally, don't shame others for not adhering to the best software development principles or design, because there are no best design principles. It's all what's best for your particular problem and your particular project. So try to understand that and try to use that when uh, deciding what you use, but also teaching others on what they should use. And finally, if I'm going to leave you with one takeaway from this talk, I'd like that to be that software design principles are your tools, they're not your goals. So you should never try to achieve solid or achieve TDD or whatever else you've heard online. You should use all those as your tools to achieve better developer experience, better software for your users, and bring more value to them. So with that, I'd like to thank you. I might be a bit early, but I guess you have. <laughs> so for those of you who had the same, same problem that I had, I'd like to talk to you. So please find me afterwards, and we can chat about it more. Thank you.